Hello, 2020 Nanoscientific Symposium attendees. My name is Adam Stieg, and it's a real pleasure to speak to you today from UCLA, where I have a brief opportunity to introduce you to some of the work we've been doing here at the California Nanosystems Institute on developing nanowire networks as a new platform technology for neuromorphic computing with specific applications at the edge. Now, when we think about computing in the context of human history, a wide variety of materials, devices, implementations, and even concepts about what computing is and how it can be done have been explored. Going back thousands of years, our ancestors used mechanical devices to perform basic computation. Moving forward to the vacuum tubes and analog systems that defined computing infrastructure in the mid and early 20th century, we've really moved into a transition of the digital revolution in the last 50 years or so that has dramatically shifted the landscape of what we think about computing and, and how it affects our everyday lives. In terms of how this revolution has moved forward, there's been a lot of players, but one of the major players is in the development of a specific piece of hardware, an engine for computing known as the integrated circuit. And through tremendous investment uh, from both academia and industry, from scientists and engineers, integrated circuits have enabled dramatic changes in the way that we imagine technology and computing can be used, the applications in which it can help us, and the ways in which it sort of you know, pervades our everyday life. Now, for those of you who are old enough to remember either the, the early 80s, the mid 80s, when we used to think about our computers in slightly different ways, a lot of what we talked about was linked to two different things. One was the fact that we always wanted to, you know, Think about packing more capability into a smaller space. We don't want to have computers that fill warehouses. We want to have them that we can carry around and fit in our pockets. Of course, this seemed like a dream some 30 years ago that's now become a reality. And this has basically you know, been codified through a thing known as Moore's Law that I won't dig into too much today. But it suffices to say that it's a trend that was predicted and that the semiconductor industry tried to follow, which basically said we need to pack more, more functionality, more, more bits more capabilities into a, into a smaller and smaller space. And that was necessary because our demands for computing continue to increase. We always want more, and the demand for computing means we need to be able to do more computation. And when I think about my life in the early 80s, we talked about the demand for computing being met by its shrinking dimensions and being able to do computations faster. We used to talk about the megahertz of our computers, the gigahertz of our processors. But what you'll see here on this diagram is that in the mid 2000, you know, the first decade of the, of the 21st century, you see that there's a leveling, right, in terms of the computing efficiency due to this thing known as a heat wall. The fact of the matter is, is that as we move information around through smaller and smaller pathways, the wires become increasingly small dimensions. We start to generate more and more heat and that dissipation of heat becomes a problem, actually physically cooling these integrated circuits becomes a limiting factor, even though we can physically shrink things to smaller dimensions. So the heat wall is one problem with why we haven't gotten faster computers, specifically in the form of how quickly it can perform computations. A second, which isn't lost on anyone who's been driving through Los Angeles, is what's known as a bottleneck, specifically a von Neumann bottleneck, which is the fact that we traditionally separate memory and processing into two different regions on our chips. Right? So we physically have to move information back and forth through this bottleneck that introduces latency, it slows things down, and it also causes these increased challenges of heat dissipation. Adding to that, the fact that the types of computation that we would like to do are becoming increasingly complex. And the reality is, is that the traditional scaling of what are known as von Neumann machines, von Neumann architectures, are not going to be able to meet the demands of the 21st century and beyond. Not only because we cannot there are fundamental limits to how well they can be scaled and the fact that they continue to consume more and more energy. But the types of problems that we're asking them to solve is not what they were specifically designed for. Deterministic processes are not the types of questions that we're asking in the 21st century. So many people will ask, does this mean that there's an end to Moore's law, right? Are we, or do we, are we at a point where we need to think differently about things? And I'm not going to get into that argument. What I would say is, is that we, we probably need to think and rethink the way in which we approach our computers. But there's a lot of room for continuing to scale and to integrate into three dimensions that can allow us to overcome some of these hardware challenges. But what we've seen in recent years is a sort of resurgence of concepts of thinking about different ways to implement 
computation, uh, different approaches to algorithms. Many of you are familiar, if you turn on your TV or you read the news, that the, the words artificial intelligence, which are not new and have been around for many decades, has seen a resurgence in recent years. To think about the ways in which we can perform computing in a similar fashion to the way that mammals or, or humans perform computing. And so the, you know, the, the major shift in the last handful of years has been towards not necessarily developing tremendously new approaches to hardware, but thinking about new ways to use that hardware. And the most common approach to that, which you may or may not be familiar with, but it, what it powers a lot of your everyday life in the technology space, is what is known as machine learning. Right? This is an approach, sort of a subclass of artificial intelligence that, that utilizes advanced algorithms uh, that have been developed, as you can see here from this slide, many, many years ago. But uh, take advantage of the tremendous advances in computing infrastructure that we have. Now, machine learning is fantastic, and I certainly am not going to claim that it has not enabled tremendous exam advances in our ability to perform computing and, and to garner information. One of the great things about it, which is that it functionally pro uh, operates without the need for, for pre-programming. And it's in its best case scenario, you basically can feed these machine learning algorithms in, in the form of artificial neural networks in many cases, a tremendous amount of data. And you see the many of the companies that we're familiar with, you, you all know that they collect tremendous amounts of data and they power our machine learning algorithms to develop rules and to define relationships uh, from those data sets that allow us to perform computation in a very, very different way. Uh, and they've been tremendously successful uh, as evidenced by the success of these companies and the fact that humans and all the rest of us really enjoy the outputs of, of, of these machine learning implementations. Now, the challenge is, is that it requires a lot of data, right? And it requires a tremendous amount of computing capacity. So this is just an example of a data center that's being built by, uh, by Facebook to, to be able to take in, process, and manipulate all of this tremendous amounts of information. And so while it's incredibly powerful, you can quickly see that the challenges associated with developing advanced machine learning algorithms and artificial intelligence that require data centers to process the information also runs into similar limits, right? Whereas you and I navigate our world every day functionally by a sandwich, right? We, we eat some food, we consume a reasonable amount of energy, but we're able to process information, very dynamic, multi-sensory data sets uh, without the need for a supercomputer. We have basically a relatively small computer here um, that, that can take in tremendous amounts of information, perform associations and predictions, et cetera, using tremendously small amounts of power. So the question is, is there a way that can think about doing artificial intelligence, machine learning, other neuromorphic or biologically inspired computing uh, approaches in different types of architectures? Because we know, right, that there's a lot more to life than just ones and zeros. Implementing these sorts of approaches in digital algorithms is not going to get us to where we need to be. Right? The, the dynamics of the mammalian brain are something that necessarily can't be easily captured in a traditional computing architecture. Now, that being said, there's been tremendous work, right, in developing and modeling uh, brains in silico, right, to understand how it is that our mammalian brains process information. Um, there's tremendous amount of effort to implement neural network uh, algorithms and hard in traditional sorts of hardware. But the challenge here is that as much as we can build bigger and better data centers that can process more and more information, the fact of the matter is that there's a lot of applications, which are what I would call and what is known as at the edge, Right, where we don't necessarily have access to huge amounts of data, or we don't have connectivity to a giant data center. So the question is, how do we empower next generation hardware to do the things that we want it to do, right, in this Internet of Things age, to take in complex data sets, to define new associations, and to learn the rules of their environment without necessarily needing tremendous amounts of data or access to tremendous computational resources. And so what we're seeking to do is to think of ways to address these challenges, not only because there's a tremendous market, but because it's a uniquely interesting challenge, I think, to rethink the way in which computing hardware can be designed to operate in these unique circumstances that very much mimic the way that you and I navigate our world. We are at the edge every day processing information from our environment right, in real time. And so what we've set out to do is to think about where we can take inspiration from neuroscience biological systems, complex systems that integrate and process 
you know, multi-sensory data sets and explore the ways in which nanoscience and technology gives us access to a new space of, a, of design, of architectural design. And so one of the things that we've been working with here at UCLA and in collaboration mainly with our colleagues at the National Institute for Material Science in Japan is to build on what are functionally known as synthetic synapses. So these are materials that have synapse-like properties but are made out of non-biological materials. Uh, the particular class of synapse that we use is known as an atomic switch. It's basically a metal insulator metal interface where a small filament grows across that junction. Uh, a lot of the initial work in the context of the sponsors of this symposium was done using scanning tunneling microscopes and atomic force microscopes to explore the, the structure and dynamics of these materials. And it's still used quite regularly to explore new materials development. With the goal of basically thinking about can we combine what we would consider to be in-memory computing, right? So instead of that von Neumann bottleneck where there was a segregation between computing and memory, right? We want to integrate those two things together. So these, these synapses can store information and process information all in the same material because of their unique nanoscale structure and the unique behaviors that exist at these smallest of dimensions where we're physically manipulating individual atoms across these junctions. And so there's been a lot of work that's gone into developing new classes of these materials. Uh, some of them are known as uh, memristors, atomic switches. There's various different types of names that get used for them. But the point is, is that they're designed to be functional elements that are nanoscale in dimension that allow us to do things that we couldn't otherwise do with the traditional transistor technology. And a lot of work has gone into implementing these types of things. This is a beautiful example by our colleague at University of Michigan, Wei Lu, who's been developing and, and implementing uh, crossbar architectures, more traditional architectures, but using these advanced nanomaterials to implement nanoscale neural networks. Right? And he's made really great progress over the last decade or so in, in taking these memristor technologies and integrating them in to new types of hardware applications. But here at UCLA, one of the things that we were very interested in is exploring the fact that at a certain point, right, if we want to think about biological inspiration or complex natural systems, right, we cannot simply reduce everything down to the individual element. Right? We know that there is a limit to reductionist concepts. It, it's important to understand the properties and behaviors of an individual switch. But when we want to couple them together to get sort of complex behaviors and emergent dynamics, right, we can't simply think that we can just put them together bit by bit and the behaviors that we'll see out of an interconnected system will be easily predicted from the behaviors of an individual element, right? And we know this to be true, right? Because in the natural world, we know that when you bring multiple pieces together, you start to observe complex patterns, unique emergent phenomenon. This is not something that hasn't been around for a long time, right? Concepts as going back as far as Aristotle, right? We all know the whole is more than the sum of its parts, right? There are new processes and new characteristics that we can explore by connecting things together intentionally. And so what we decided to do a number of years ago is to hearken back to an idea uh, posited many years ago that was less well known than the Turing machine by Alan Turing that many of us are familiar with that forms one of, you know, sort of the foundation of modern computers, which is this, what is called a Turing uh, B-type machine, a highly interconnected network, right? Where instead of isolating all of the elements into individual bits, we want to intentionally connect them together and we can expect that it can perform a different class of computation. And so we set out uh, about 10 years ago or so to develop nanowire neural networks where the interconnections between all of the junctions in these self-organized nanowires are these functional synapses. It's very similar to the structural properties of what is uh, in your neocortex, what is known as the neuropill in the brain. And so we use a combination of top-down and bottom-up self-organization to basically produce, there's the slide, it's working. We produce through electroless deposition, basically highly interconnected networks of metallic nanowires that are subsequently functionalized to position individual switches at these junctions. And while I don't have enough time today to introduce you and to get into all the details of the ways in which they're made, suffice it to say that when you actually connect these networks together and you provide an energy in the form of an electrical stimulation or an optical stimulation, and you look at how that energy is distributed throughout the system, right? there are persistent 
and stable dynamics within the network because of the interactions between these individual elements within a highly complex network that can be uh, understood in the context of emergent properties of a complex interconnected system. Right? And so what we've done over the years is to understand this, what, you know, what is going on inside of these networks. We've had a various different app, uh, examples of the fact that, you know, for example, we, don't, we, we do have distributed electrical activity. We don't have an individual electrical pathway, a conduction or percolation pathway forming. We have a dynamic and stably, you know, sort of fluctuating and reconfiguring network architecture. Uh, the information is spatially and temporally correlated within that network. And we've sought to understand the, how the properties of an individual switch, for example, versus one embedded in a network differ. So we've done work experimentally as well as in, in simulation by developing new types of uh, state equations for the devices that we're using, interconnecting them into networks and trying to understand the properties and characteristics for how these behavior, how these systems respond to energetic stimulus. And now I, I laid this out in the context of computing, right? Because what we would like to have is a dynamical system, right? A system that can take in information and perform computation, right? And the way in which we have envisioned doing that is using, rather than a traditional neural network, where every single junction, the, 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 what's called the, the weight, the synaptic weight of every interconnection needs to be tuned, we are using a class of techniques that are known as reservoir computing, right? Where we basically think about feeding the network information, allowing it to evolve and adapt, to manipulate that information through the physical interconnections of the network itself, and then collecting how that information is transformed as a transformation of the input data that was presented to it, right? There is learning and adaptation going on inside the network as it's presented with information. And in the context of reservoir computing, one of the things that I'd like to point out is that, you know, it's important that the, the elements that we have interconnected in the reservoir are what we know is nonlinear. And I don't have, again, a lot of time to get into this, but a simple sort of token example of a traditional uh, X or function is that nonlinearity, right, is not capable of solving this nonlinear task, right? If you think about the truth table for an XOR operation, which is a traditional logic operation, you can't draw a straight line, right, that defines the solution to this task. However, if you increase the dimensionality, or what we call the separability of the, of the system into two dimensions, a higher dimensional representation, you can now draw a plane that separates these two solutions, right? So you can solve the problem by transforming the system into what we call a higher order representation. And so we've implemented this as this is an example where we, we deliver the signals of an XOR operation into one of our nanowire networks. It is nonlinear transformed into a higher dimensional representation, and we can classify the output of that in real time without the need for any pre-programming. Right? So this device is able to perform, for example, the XOR operation specifically because of its nonlinear character. And so we've implemented these nanowire networks to perform various different types of tasks. We've shown that it can manipulate uh, uh, time-varying signals in various ways. We've performed, for example, all of the traditional logic operations. We've implemented things that are known as parity tests, right, which is sort of a memory task. We have implemented what is known as a T-maze, which is a prediction-based task. Uh, and we've also implemented a chaotic time series prediction. So these devices are specifically designed to be sort of platforms for learning and adaptation that are sort of agnostic to the signals that they receive, right? I'm not going to state that they can solve any problem, but the networks themselves have been shown that a single network can solve many problems, and it can solve multiple problems simultaneously. And so we're very interested in taking this type of a network and developing it further into a device that can be deployed in an edge application. As you saw a moment ago, and as you see in the picture here, these devices can fit in your hand. Right? And so what we're thinking and what we'd really be interested to do is to take this to the next level where this type of a device could be uh, sort of a, a component in a computational system that can perform chip on chip learning and memory and adaptation such that it can do more complex tasks than what you could normally associate with a device without the need to necessarily be connected to the cloud or to a data center. And so, with that, I would just say that for those of you who find this at all interesting or intriguing, 
right? There's been some popular coverage of this in the press, as well as various different uh, publications over the years. And I'd like to just end here and thank the organizers uh, for the opportunity to speak today, specifically Stefan Keimer, who uh, extended the invitation to me, um, as well as all of my collaborators. Right? No, none of this work could be done without my collaborators, specifically Jim Jimshevsky at UCLA, who I've been working with for many years, as well as our colleagues at the National Institute of Material Science, uh, and specifically uh, MANA in Japan, as well as colleagues at Portland State and the University of Sydney course, the funding agencies who paid for all this to happen. And with that, I'd just like to thank you for your attention and this brief introduction to some of the work that we're doing to rethink the way in which we can develop next generation hardware to solve some of the future problems that we face at the edge of computing.